Good afternoon, Seven Investors, and welcome to the Monday edition of Seven Investing Now. My name is Daniel Brooks Klein, but you can call me Dan. My friends call me Dan. I'm joined today by Steve Symington, Austin Lieberman, and Max Chasco. Guys, when I went to bed last night, besides the fact that the uh, Tom Brady was not playing well, that was not a great Sunday night football game, we were supposed to have a tropical storm and maybe a hurricane. I woke up to like a Disney movie, like birds chirping, everything delightful. It's sunny. Other than there's like a lake in my front yard that's not normally there, all looked really good. But the markets had gone insane. And that's what we're going to kick off today with. Before we do that, I just want to introduce everybody and why they're here. Steve and Austin are going to be here the whole show. Max is only joining us to talk about the uh, the Pfizer vaccine that is setting the market crazy. Uh, Steve, why don't you introduce yourself to the seven investors? Hey, uh, seven investors. I'm Steve Symington. I'm up here in Missoula, Montana. I normally focus on artificial intelligence uh, technology stocks. I have a professional background as a software engineer and a math guy, so I'm a giant nerd, but uh, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with this crew. I, I appreciate uh, the diversified expertise we have. Austin Lieberman, uh, you are in Florida as well, but you're a little far north. Did you get a hurricane, a tropical storm? Like uh, any, did, did it rain? Like what's going on there? It's a little windy here, but it's really sunny. Um, and so do we call them seven investors because there's only seven people listening to this? There's seven <laughs> investors listening to this? There are the millions of, of sevens of people listening to this, hopefully, uh, as you aggregate. we You can find this later on YouTube. You can find it on our podcast channel. You can find it on Twitter. We're on MySpace, I'm pretty sure. We're on classmates.com. Any place you can get a podcast. We are the, we're on Craigslist. We are available. Last to our party today is Max Chasco. Max, you are our medical expert. You've been helping me for the past six months try to get over my Pac-Man fever. Now you're going to tell us what the Pfizer vaccine means. Why don't you give us a little bit about your credentials as a way of introduction? Credentials? I don't have any of those. Um, <laughs> no, I uh, have a couple engineering degrees, bioprocess engineering, so that's actually scaling up vaccine manufacturing processes or beer, pick or, pick or one, and uh, material science engineering, so... So we woke up this morning to news that Pfizer's vaccine has tested 90% effective. To say the market liked this would be putting it mildly. But market was up about 1,100 points last I, last I looked. And like some pretty crazy stocks, like, like Royal Caribbean was up 30%. And I don't want to say pump the brakes, but let's pump the brakes a little bit. Max, what does this vaccine mean for life getting back to normal? Yeah, sorry guys, I am uh, had a little technical difficulties. Can you hear me okay? Is this better? Yeah, you sound good. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so today, uh, before the market opened, uh, Pfizer and its partner BioNTech uh, made an announcement that you know their vaccine candidate they're working on for SARS-CoV-2, which is the coronavirus strain that's causing this pandemic, is over 90% effective uh, due to an, or you know, based on data from an ongoing clinical trial. Um, so 90% effective or over 90% is a very high number we were talking here, you know, governments were saying, given the circumstances, uh, they might accept something much lower than that, you know, 60s or 70 percent uh, just to roll it out and, and get it into the population. So greater than 90 percent effectiveness is, is very good. So, Max, where does something like the flu vaccine come in? It, you know, 90 percent sounds good, but it still means one in 10 get this, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, this is different than the, the flu vaccine. So there's there's really no apples to apples comparison there. Um, in fact, this vaccine, uh, because of how it works, and this is true for, for most of these uh, coronavirus vaccines, should work against most coronaviruses. So that includes the original SARS and, and MERS as well. Um, so now there's still safety data that have to be released. Pfizer said it's looking to uh, release that sometime before the end of this month, but it will seek emergency authorization or emergency use from the US FDA. Uh, a couple things to keep in mind though. Um, so, you know, it's gonna take time to roll this out, obviously. Um, Pfizer said it looks like it's gonna have maybe 50 million doses available in 2020, and then 1.3 billion doses available uh, in 2021. But this is an mRNA vaccine. So that means you have to get two doses 28 days apart. Um, so for all of you people out there who procrastinate, this is going to be really, you have to like come up with all this willpower to make it back to the doctors four weeks after you get your first dose. Um, so 50 million doses means, I'm sorry, a hundred million. I think I misspoke there, but, uh, if they have a hundred million doses available in 2020, that's only enough for 50 million people. So you have to divide 
the doses for these by two. It's also going to take time to roll these out, right? There's a lot of uh, manufacturing obstacles, logistical hurdles. We have to keep these things very cold when we're distributing them. Uh, and then you have to hope that wherever you live actually is uh, competent and can uh, administer these and, and that there are no hiccups there. Um, well, I live in Florida, so that is not not going to be something that goes. So, Max, I got, I got one more for you. Do we have the infrastructure to distribute a vaccine that has to be kept, I believe, at negative 80 degrees? Is that how, how big a hurdle is that? Yeah, so there's some numbers floating around, negative 80 degrees Celsius, right? Um, that's true for some mRNA vaccines. I don't know if that's necessarily true for this one from Pfizer and BioNTech, uh, but it does need to be kept very cold, maybe negative 20, negative 40. Uh, and, and basically it just affects the shelf life, right? So even if you don't keep it perfectly in the cold chain, uh, it might still be viable for three, six months uh, on the shelf or on the shelf being in a freezer, of course. Um, but negative 80 is probably not, uh, not what it is. But yeah, we have the infrastructure, but even in the US, there's probably going to be, you know, difference in access, whether you live in an urban uh, region or in a rural community, um, we're probably going to be see differences regionally in terms of how well this goes, how smoothly this goes. But, you know, I would remind people, this is going to take time. Um, this isn't the only vaccine we're going to have. And, um, you know, but it's going to take maybe a year to roll this out and get it through enough of the population. Um, you know, like the UN United States isn't going to get the first 100 million doses from Pfizer, right? They're, uh, BioNTech's a German company, and they're going to be distributing this in, in Europe as well. So, um, you know, the stock market's doing very well, and it, it is good news, but it's, Seems weird to price all this in right now. There's still, uh, we have to go through the winter and the pandemic and it's worse. It's the worst it's ever been everywhere. So, uh, you know, the worst might still be ahead for the pandemic. We have to roll this out. We're changing uh, administrations here in the United States. So that's going to get weird. And there's just a lot of things that could uh, surprise the market based on how it's it's reacting today. Max, I'm going to come back to you at the end here, but uh, Caleb Lyon says, thank you for talking about the vaccine and some details, doses, administration, et cetera. I trust Seven Investing. Uh, we appreciate you trusting us. Oh, I trust Seven Investing and the information you share. Thanks again. Yeah, we work really hard at getting it right. Steve Symington, we talked about, you know, 50 million. They're not all going to go to the U.S., are the markets overvaluing this? I don't think this changes one thing about American life, except maybe some doctors get this, uh, which will be good for all of us. I don't think this changes anything in the course of 2020. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess the, the one thing to keep in mind is the market's a forward-looking machine and the market hates uncertainty. And we saw a lot of that last week. Uh, with the election when it was kind of uncertain what the rules were going to be, who was going to win or be the presumptive winner, uh, the president-elect. And once we got some certainty to that, the market rallied. And uh, that's just kind of how it goes. Uh, it's not surprising. The market's rallying on confirmation of, of a viable vaccine. Um, we can't say we didn't expect this day to come, but it's as good a reason as any. Uh, and really, like Max said, coupled with expectations for a Biden presidency and a split Congress is another thing we're keeping in mind uh, that, you know, for example, might make changes to corporate tax rates less likely. Um, these are all things that are, are really spurring people to buy when they otherwise might not uh, have done so uh, when it comes to equity securities. So uh, it's, you know, they're moving as fast as they can. Uh, but I think that we have more concrete hope and uh, and and really, you know, we kind of see this light at the end of the tunnel. That's why we're seeing what we're seeing today. We're going to talk more market and throw to Austin Lieberman in a second, but I want to ask Max a question. Max, is this something Pfizer can uh, outsource? Can they go to other medical companies and say, hey, this vaccine works. Will you make some? Are there ways to, to speed up production here? Oh, Max appears to have been muted. So we are right. going to... Uh, I'm back. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, man, technical difficulties today. Um, yeah, so I think this is true for all vaccine developers, but they're each working with, um, you know, contract manufacturers globally. So Pfizer and BioNTech are working with manufacturers in the US. They're working with manufacturers in Europe. Um, so it's not a matter of like outsourcing the technology, so to speak, but just making sure there's enough manufacturing capacity available. Um, so, there, you know, there are limits to how much we can manufacture. And Again, there's multiple vaccines and limited production capacity, and not just for making the vaccine, but also the vials that we need, um, different syringes, like how we administer it. Um, you know, the vials that we need to keep these because they're such cold temperatures. There's there's not very many of those around, um, so 
there could be bottlenecks or hiccups still to come. My freezer is available if Pfizer <laughs> wants to store it. King Kang asks, and I'm going to throw this to Austin. Can you guys give your opinion on how you would position your in general at home stocks? Buy the dip, hold or sell. We're going to talk about Zoom later as Austin's what I'm watching. But Austin, does this change your thoughts on, say, Teladoc or, or Netflix or any of the big you know, at home companies? Uh, Dan, it doesn't. It's a, it's a really good question. And um, we talk about long-term investing here, right? But we're all human. And so if you're feeling a little anxiety or anxiousness, um, we're not going to be a team here that like makes you feel put down because of that. If you're feeling that, that's a natural feeling. My A lot of my portfolio is down today. The only thing I would say on this topic, Dan, um, aside from what we're going to talk about with Zoom, is own companies that, you know, one day of, of, you know, a, a news announcement doesn't change your thesis for owning or not owning those companies. If you own great companies, the valuation that the market gives it might be a little bit ahead of itself with like some of these these great um, technology companies and, and at home companies that are that are dropping today. But if they're truly great companies, then over three years, five years, 10 years, their businesses will likely be just fine. And then the, the stock price will, will catch up to the performance of the business, regardless of these short-term movements up, up or down. They just happen. Yeah. And it's not an either or. Like, And I think that's where people are missing the boats. So let's talk about Peloton and Netflix. Right now, you might solely use your Peloton because you're not going to the gym. If there's a vaccine, some days you're going to go to the gym, some days you're going to use your Peloton. It's still a value. Steve, are you the only person in your house who watches television or just sometimes your wife and kids? Uh, and thereby, if you canceled Netflix, they'd probably get mad at you, right? <laughs> they'd be, they'd be uh, kind of upset. But yeah, no, we've got multiple streaming services. And of course, I'm not the only person who watches. But yeah, I mean, look. <laughs> Yeah. There was a period at the, at the beginning of the pandemic where all of my food orders were via Instacart. Like Instacart was like a job for me. Now that I go to the grocery store, I still use Instacart. I'm still going to be a paying member. I think it's really important to pump the brakes and say, okay, even if I use Netflix this, I don't pay less for it. This isn't uh, this isn't like going to the movies where they only get paid if I go to the movies. Uh, so Max, let me ask one more question here. When we say 90% effective, does that mean hard and fast 90% of people get it, don't get the disease? Or does that mean you might get it, but you're going to get a lesser version of it and it won't be as damaging? I'm not sure. So they had uh, the way that they determined effectiveness and they were careful and conservative actually in saying greater than 90%. So they had over, it was like 46,000 individuals got the vaccine and then they uh, followed them to see how many individuals later er, uh, came down with, you know, an infection of SARS-CoV-2. So they only had uh, about 94, 96, I don't remember the exact number, uh, actual infections among those people. So if you do the math, that's, you know, 99.8% uh, effective, but that's not how it works because some people might not have come into contact with it. Um, so, you know, we still have to do long-term tracing of these individuals that were in the trial. Um, as far as does this make it less uh, an infection, you know, less, uh, less severe, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's how it works. That, that might indeed be how it works, but, uh, I'm not sure. So as we close out this topic, first of all, feel free to get your comments and your questions in. We're getting to as many of them as we can. Uh, but that being said, let me throw it around the room and, and I'll start with Steve. When, there's going to be a vaccine. I think that's fair to say. Does this change anything about your investing strategy? And for me, all I'll say is it might give me an opportunity to occasionally buy something I was going to buy at a better price. You know, maybe I was going to buy shares on Wednesday and I see them down today. So I'll just buy, I'll put the money in my account a little earlier. That's the only change I'm making. Steve, your thoughts. Yeah, I uh, it changes nothing for me, and uh, I'll agree with that. I actually posted a survey on Twitter just before this, talking about the stay-at-home stocks and whether you think it's a buying opportunity or an opportunity to pivot instead into stocks that might benefit from an economic reopening. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll spoil my answer for you, even though the survey is going to still go for a while. I, I, I chose A. I mean, I, I think this is an opportunity to revisit some of the stocks that you liked at higher prices. Uh, and and are actually falling on today's news, even as the Dow's you know soaring a thousand points or whatever it is. But uh, I think this is something. Uh, the only thing it's done for me is maybe given me a chance to open or add to a position in a company that I probably otherwise would have anyway. Because yeah, it changes. 
And be very wary. Like AMC stock was up some crazy amount today. You know what's not going to do well <laughs> post-pandemic? Movie theaters. We've had a fundamental change where we're only going to go see blockbusters. We're not going to see a big comeback of movie theaters. Austin Lieberman, your final thoughts. Yeah, really just echoing what Steve said. And we, and we saw people out, out on um, Twitter talking about this. And kind of the way I think about it is a 10%, especially in the types of companies I invest in, which are considered high growth companies, a 10% pullback or gain is is nothing that changes nothing. If we start to see 30%, 40% pullbacks on great companies that I think are going to be great for a long time, that's when I would start to consider, okay, maybe I need to add more now than I was initially planning on adding. I'm not talking about using crazy amounts of margin or anything like that. Just that would make me uh, allocate a little heavier to stocks. Like maybe I try to squeeze some extra monthly contributions in or cut out expenses and add more or whatever, but a 10 or 20% drop, that's just normal. Just, just doing as normal and focusing on great companies. And before I give Max the last word and we let him go, I'll say, so I allocate a certain amount of money each week to invest. And if I really see an opportunity, I'm in a financial position where I could take that money early. So I won't necessarily change how much I invest in the year, but maybe I'll make all of my December investing decisions a little bit early mm -hmm. and just sort of move some money from the checking account into the investing account. Max, before you go, and I assume you're going back to boxing training, uh, but what is it your, what are your last thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, uh, same thing that that um, Steve and Austin said, but um, you know, I might just add a little more color. So, you know, the point of investing, you buy great businesses and you hold on forever. Um, so that doesn't change no matter what the market's doing. Um, but I might just say that it, to me, it seems like the market's pricing in like this removal of uncertainty because we have some early stage data from a vaccine that hasn't been approved or distributed yet. So I would just say expect more volatility. Um, if the safety data has something in there or there's, you know, we encounter hiccups in, in the logistical side of this uh, in the next six months, um, you know, the market might wobble a little bit. So again, that shouldn't matter at all because if you're buying great companies and holding them, then days like today really don't mean anything and it shouldn't change your long-term uh, perspective. Max Chatsko, thank you for joining us. You are watching 7 Investing Now. I am Dan Klein. We're about to pivot to what we're watching. That's each one of us, or in this case, Austin and Steve, each bringing a story to the table that they're looking at. Austin is going to talk about Zoom, a company very much in line with what we're talking. Steve is going to talk about a second round of stimulus. Before we do that, let's talk a little bit about 7 Investing. So we are all lead advisors at 7 Investing. What does that mean? That means that each month we each make a stock pick for investors. There's six of us right now. We're going to reveal the seventh investor on Wednesday's show, the seventh lead advisor. So you're going to want to write that down. Each of us makes a stock pick, and then right now we make a team pick. So you get, as a member, 17 picks for $7. Good value. But Steve, what else do they get? Oh, man. they uh, and One of the kind of underappreciated parts of a 7 Investing subscription is you get access to our team of advisors. You can ask us questions anytime. We're more than happy to answer them. Uh, we also provide continuous updates on our recommendations. So any uh, big news, anything that you need to know about uh, about these companies, it's not just that we pick them and we move on and forget about them, uh, but there is a, a, a lot more. You know, we have subscriber only Zoom calls where you can you can log in, you can we talk about the picks that we previously recommended that are most compelling to us. Uh, there's a whole lot that you get as part of that subscription. But if you want to, uh, seveninvesting.com, subscribe, seventeen dollars a month, hundred seventy dollars a year if you go for the annual subscription. Uh, and uh, we've had people tell us recently that they feel like they're stealing from us. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that made me chuckle a little bit the other day. And, and, and if the vaccine works and we all get it, we're all coming to my house for a barbecue or, or maybe outside. I don't know that there's enough room in the condo for the many people who have joined us on the seven investing journey. Guys, now it is time for what we're watching. Austin, Zoom has been a bit of a saga for you. This has been an incredibly hot stock uh, that got a lot more attention be because of the pandemic. I use Zoom. Steve, I know you use Zoom pre-pandemic because we work someplace where Zoom was very much a part of the culture. Austin, where do you stand on Zoom today? Yeah, if anybody has followed me anywhere on Twitter or on a podcast or listened to these shows, you've probably heard me talk about Zoom. And I've had kind of a love sell possibly love again relationship 
with the stock, right? And so um, this this does go into kind of what we've been talking about. And so just to give some context, because uh, when I talk about individual companies, which we can't share the recommendations that our members are paying us for, but Zoom is not an official seven investing recommendation. So when I'm talking about this, I want to be fully transparent. I don't currently or, own shares. Or is it? <laughs> yeah. Or is it? Maybe it is. Because uh, I guess we can talk about them. We just don't associate them directly with the service. So yeah, subscribe and find out. Uh, but anyways, my saga with Zoom, I owned it um, basically at IPO. On April 4th, I tweeted out that uh, I had added a bunch of shares and that I thought that basically on, on the growth that I thought was going to happen, that they could hit over $400 a share this year. That happened. Um and then again, on July, I tweeted out that I, st I thought it was kind of cheap and reiterated the fact that I thought it could hit $400 a share. And then on, uh, let's see, this was like October 5th or 10th. It was just a few weeks ago. I said that this is a sad day for me. I just sold my shares of Zoom. Um, it was a beautiful ride. I'm a huge fan, but I think it'll outperform, but it's at $150 billion valuation, incredible tailwinds. And I think there's better places for my money. And then just this weekend, uh, I want to delete all these tweets. I was saying that Zoom could hit $1,000 by the end of the year. Uh, the market was closed, so those tweets don't really count. But here's where I stand. I think the company is a fantastic company. I think we ha you had to have expected uh, volatility anytime vaccine talks came up. But uh, I still believe that this company is going to be a, a long-term outperformer. And Maybe it doesn't hit a thousand. Maybe it does hit a thousand dollars by the end, end of this year. But I'm still very confident that uh, the way that they're innovating, the way that they're operating, the new products they're releasing, this company is still going to outperform the S and P 500. Uh, it could still, you know, I think realistically double in in three to five years, and that be sustainable. And when we're talking about normal investing years, which this has not been for cloud and high growth companies, a double in three to five years is pretty good, you know. Uh, so let me jump in here. Um What's the path to growth here? Like, obviously, a lot of people who would have eventually gotten Zoom now have Zoom. Can they keep adding users, or is it about selling more to existing users? I think both, Dan. Um, they're, I don't think they're going to grow users as fast as they have. That would just be an unrealistic expectation. But the entire world needs to be able to communicate. And Zoom does a lot more than just video, which is what they, they're known for. They have Zoom phone, which just helps businesses streamline their, their basically phone connectivity instead of having to have uh, multiple providers and, and different things like that. They can streamline it under um, basically all under Zoom service. And then it ties directly into and integrates directly with uh, their Zoom meetings. So when we think about um, banks and airlines and you know all different types of businesses some that are going to start to to expand um, once the economy opens up there's still a lot of room for growth um, for for zoom within their businesses but also uh, new products and we saw a lot of new exciting products get announced at zoomtopia um, just to cover a couple big ones on zoom which is an online events platform and marketplace for paid zoom users who want to create host and monetize classes that's not going to go away. This this phenomenon is going to continue. There's also a ton of competition in that space that's pretty well established. So, you know, it, it, yes, it absolutely could work, but it's not like they've invented that. Uh, they haven't, but they've got such market share and so many people using it that uh, I think that's going to be a huge market for them. Um, and then the other big one, Zoom apps. So um, just being able to use your favorite apps like Atlassian, Asana, Box, Dropbox, PagerDuty, and Slack directly on the Zoom platform. So this starts to make Zoom uh, almost the, a center place for work and communication where while you're in Zoom meetings, you can use these different applications natively. That's just two. They had a bunch of uh, other exciting ones, but the, the thing is, is they're going to keep innovating. They're going to keep delivering new products. Um, that is their path to growth. Is it currently valued or is, is some of that currently valued in the stock price? Maybe. That's what, that's what we have to figure out. Final question here, Austin, and, and I ask it only because I feel like we have to, because people hit us with this question all the time. What about major competitors? Microsoft has Teams, Google has Meet. Dear God, don't use Google Meet. If you want everyone to be really fuzzy and hard to understand, that's the way yeah. to go. But there's all sorts of competition in this space. Can there be more than one winner? Can Microsoft eventually take over for, for Zoom? What's the, the competitive outlook there? 
Yeah, that, that's a good and an, an important question. Um, we've seen the competition from those big players. I think as long as Zoom sticks to what's worked so far, and that's the ability to innovate and scale and, and provide a, a better experience than uh, their competitors, it's, it's also kind of Zoom's livelihood, right? Like Microsoft isn't isn't going to hurt if uh, if if they don't get take Zoom's market share of video, but Zoom would basically die as a company if they lost theirs. Um, interesting thing, I talked to my mom who's having some follow-ups for uh, an arm surgery she had, and she's actually doing her doctor follow-ups. Uh, they use Microsoft Teams. And so I thought that was it. I just found out about that uh, this weekend. Um, they they do a call to my mom uh, and then they give her the link and then she joins a link and has her her doctor's meetings with Teams. So yes, it's, it, it's something to keep an eye on. But I think, like you said, it's a, more than just a winner take all. Multiple companies can win. So the big thing is is just is Zoom's valuation is it is it way way overvalued, or is it is it going to grow into the the valuation that it has? And again, I currently don't have a position in it, so I'm I, I might buy shares though. Again, if if we see another ten percent or twenty percent drop from here, so we'll see. So let me throw this out there, uh, and I'm going to answer kind of my own question. We talked earlier about Netflix and Teladoc, and while we won't use these services as much post-pandemic, we're still going to use them. And I, and I think the story for Zoom is a lot of the places, say the yoga studios, the dance studios, the gyms, that were using Zoom for their whole business for the past six or seven months, they're still going to have those feeds for the person who can't make it in, for the person that you know isn't feeling well that day. The same thing with schools and other places. So just because we're not spending spending 12 hours a day on Zoom doesn't mean we're not going to pay for Zoom. And I think that's really important to remember. The other thing I'll throw out there is we talk a lot about how there's going to be less travel. And I agree, we might not like go across the country for one meeting, but that's not why people travel. People travel because they like to travel. There's going to be less travel. Zoom will enhance that. Look, when we all worked at, at, at a different place, um, I used to have meetings and I'd be in the building, but I couldn't get from one room to another. So I would zoom into the meeting, even though I was only a few floors away. There's a lot of story left to tell here. This is Seven Investing Now. I am Dan Klein. I'm being joined by Austin Lieberman and Steve Simonton. Steve, you're what we're watching today is the expectation for stimulus. Mm -hmm. I'm so confused. Where do we stand? We have a an outgoing president who doesn't want to leave. We have a lame duck Congress and two Senate runoffs. Can a lame duck Congress pass something? Like, can they all get in the same room and agree? I, I, I am, I'm not optimistic here. So, so I think they're gonna try. Uh, that that's sort of uh, what we're looking at today. Uh, some members of Congress, some newly elected members of Congress, are already urging President Trump, Nancy Pelosi, and Mitch McConnell to come together and pass a second stimulus package before the end of 2020. So McConnell. Uh, in particular, just secured his reelection in this cycle. And he's already said uh, just a few days ago that passing another stimulus package is job number one for him during this so-called lame duck period. And uh, I, I agree personally that time is of the essence and you know, no partisan opinions here, but uh, many individuals and small businesses uh, are in dire need of this aid as soon as possible. And uh, I hope they can get something passed. Um, we've already talked about the implications of a divided Congress on a corp, you know, corporate tax rates. Uh, they, they would be unlikely to change uh, if we have you know, Republicans in control of the Senate and Democrats in control of the House whoever's in the White House. Uh, one measure that seems to have uh, fairly strong bipartisan support is another direct payment of $1,200 for individuals uh, up to $2,400 per married couple, $500 per child was what happened last time. Those numbers are subject to uh, income limits and obviously subject to change. Um, but, uh, you know, the, I guess what, what really um, is going to determine whether it's passed is whether uh, both sides of uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans can come together. You know, on one hand, you have uh, Republicans who've tried to propose a, a pair of $500 billion stimulus packages that Democrats have struck down because they want something that's larger than $2 trillion. So they need to find some middle ground. And uh, it, it's going to be very interesting over the coming weeks. This is going to be something I think that's going to dominate headlines because that's what's next up is, is yeah, it's. It, it's a breakdown of where the aides go. The Republican, the aid 
the aid goes. The Republican packages tend to focus on businesses getting it, you know, another however many billion for airlines and not necessarily small business, not yeah. necessarily individuals. We're heading into Christmas. It is going to be really telling, you know, if this money goes out, if we get the $1,200 checks, $500 per kid going to many, many Americans, uh, this is definitely going to be one of those scenarios where some of that money from people who are doing well is going to get spent frivolously and that's good for the yeah. economy look if if i go to the mall and i buy new sunglasses and a bunch of cinnabons and and who knows what else that supports the economy steve i'll give you the last word here i'll, I'll let you 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 yeah. make a prediction here do you oh, think <laughs> we have stimulus before we have a presidential transition on january 20th also a congressional um. transition I think if we have something before January 20th, it's going to be smaller uh, than many people want it to be. And, uh, you know, the the Biden administration is already outlining their plan. It includes more for small businesses and more state funding. Uh, but it'll be really interesting and telling, I think, uh, if both sides of the aisle can come together uh, on a package. And, uh, you know, I and there's always possibility for uh, an incremental um, stimulus after January 20th as well. But I think, um, I think I, I, I'm going to guess that we will get something beforehand because I think the damage of not doing so uh, will, will be, um, will, will be, well, it'll be pretty destructive to the economy. So, so we shall see, but JP asks, have you guys thought about setting up a seven investing Slack slash Discord channel? We're not there yet. So one of the next things we're going to be launching is a blog. And 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 I hate using the word blog, but it's going to be a place for content to go. Some of that is going to be members only content. So we have more of an ability to give you our thoughts in the moment. Some of that is going to be public facing content. Uh, and will we take comments there? Will we interact with people? Of course, right now, the best place to interact with us is on Twitter, hitting us at seven investing on Twitter or emailing us info at seven investing.com. You're going to get an answer. Remember, we can't talk about your personal financial situation. We can tell you our opinions on a stock or something you're thinking about doing. We're, we're, we're not CFAs. We're not CPA. We can't give you uh, personal financial advice, but we can certainly answer broad questions. And we love to interact on social media. Guys, we're nearing the end. It is time to hit our finisher. Sam Bailey, our marketing director, our producer behind the glass. Uh, feel free to share it. Which company will have the highest market cap in 2025? Right now, that would be Apple. They have the highest market cap. Only 13.6% of you said that's going to be the case. Amazon, 58% wins this overwhelmingly. Tesla, 18.6%. Microsoft, 9.8%. Austin Lieberman, do you agree with this? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know it's tough um i think it'll be apple i think it'll be I, apple. I i agree with that as well as much as i believe in amazon i think healthcare is going to be a trillion dollar investment for apple mm. and i'll keep saying it i'll say it every time i possibly can in the show apple kill apple tv you are throwing good money after bad license whatever content you have to netflix or to somebody else stop pursuing this strategy go into healthcare more fully steve simonton your thoughts here oh man um i i honestly think i'm gonna go out on a limb and say um uh, tesla right. you're going I'll, with I'll tesla probably amazon but <laughs> i'm gonna say that tesla is gonna give them a run for one run for their money though to be honest in the next five years uh, it's it's gonna be really interesting uh Those we're talking sales. about a company that's yeah they're valued at over 400 billion right now but i think they've got they've you know in the next five years i think they're gonna stun some people so uh i i probably would have voted for tesla but i think uh i think amazon uh, will probably I, be the largest at that point. I, I think the challenge for Amazon is margin. The products mm -hmm. they're going to go into, like opening a chain of grocery stores is great. It helps their logistics, but it's actually pretty low margin, very competitive business. Mm -hmm. Again, healthcare could be the answer there. And guys, if I told you Tesla in 2025 was going to be a $3 trillion company, that sounds plausible. If I told you it was going to be bankrupt or owned by General Motors, that's <laughs> plausible as well. So sure. this is an interesting one. Guys, that's the end of our show. Thank you, Max Chatsko, at the top for joining us on the vaccine. 
Austin, Steve, thanks you for doing this. This is, of course, Seven Investing Now. And as I said earlier, if you want to get in touch with us, you can hit us up at Seven Investing on Twitter or info at seveninvesting.com uh, via email. Thank you for watching. We will see you again for a very special show, The Seventh Investor Revealed on Wednesday. Guys, see you down the road. See you, everybody.